Welcome back to this series on STM32 based hardware design with Outim Designer. We finally come to the PCB routing stage after having looked at PCB layout in the previous video. I'll be going over the main aspects and what to look out for when it comes to PCB routing. Because we did a fairly decent job last time in the layout, this makes our routing life so much easier as we'll see. Again, I'll be covering the broad aspects of PCB layout and routing and I'll be suggesting a three hour video which guides you through the whole routing process. Of course, make sure to follow along as usual and give this a try for yourself and in your own time. If you haven't already, make sure to check out the link in the description below to get yourself an Altium Designer free trial. With that being said, let's get started. Here we are back in Altium Designer on the PCB document for our STM32 based breakout board. You can already see I've pretty much finished the routing and the design for this breakout board because I'd like to go through certain aspects of routing and layout, the switching regulator, microcontroller and so forth in this video. If I went through the whole entire process of this, this would be several videos long and I'd like to give you a more condensed version. If you'd really like to have a step-by-step -step guide, you can check out my channel called Phil's Lab, a complete STM32 based PCB design walkthrough, which also guides you through the entire routing process. So click by click if you want far more depth. Now we're just gonna go through the essentials and hopefully you can then use those to follow along in your own time and try making this PCB for yourself rather than following step-by-step. I learn the best not by following step by step but rather having my own project and trying to root it and check with my design guidelines and this is what I hope to achieve with this video. This is a two layer board, we have a top layer with all the components and we have a bottom layer. The first thing I'd like to show you is that we have a solid ground plane on layer 2. I'll also show you later how I filled the top layer also with a ground plane as well. And for two layer boards this is generally recommended because the thickness of a two layer board is rather thick. So the fields coupling between layer 1 and layer 2, layer 2 then being our return path hopefully, is rather large. By then also filling the top layer in for two layer boards where we have such a thick dielectric space in between, it oftentimes is beneficial to pour copper and then connect it to reference voltage, for example, ground or zero volt, so to speak, just so we maintain better return paths. As you can see, for example, the, the spacing between our copper pour, which is this large surface here, to this spacing is about 0.15 millimeters, whereas the board thickness is about 1.6 millimeters, so 10 times that. In Alton Design, I can press P and then G or go down to polygon pour to start poly drawing a polygon pour. For example, I could do something like so, just as a random example, right click to cancel, and then I have a new polygon pour. And that's exactly what I did to put my ground plane on layer two. On layer one, I did exactly the same thing, but I did do my routing first. In the properties panel on the right side, with your relevant polygon pour selected, I can click on shelf, and then it hides the polygon. On the topic of polygon pores, because we have multiple of the same voltage levels, so ground planes in this case, you can see all of these stitching vias, which I've placed around here, to tie my two ground planes or my two ground pores together. This is to minimize inductances. And I've done this as a fairly regular spacing. Don't worry too much about these vias for now. These are stitching vias for our ground planes. What we're concerned about mainly is the routing for now. So let's go through that. In 3D view, let's check out our switch mode converter first, which is an inductor, output capacitor C103, input capacitor C102, main IC U100, as well as our feedback network. Going back to 2D view, pressing 2 on the keyboard, you can see again I've used a polygon pore for the output of the inductor, going to my output capacitor. Because we did our layout fairly neatly last time in the last video, this means this has really simplified the routing process. For my LC connection, I could also use a wide trace, but for my buck switch node, so from the output of my C to the inductor, I'm just using the wide trace. I don't want to maximize the area I use for this connection because this is a high frequency and oftentimes can be a high current switching node. Thus, by making this connection larger than needed, I'm adding capacitance, which is a bad thing generally for high speed designs. On the input side, I have my input capacitor simply with a fairly wide trace. Remember, this is only up to about 300 milliamps of current and I'm using a 0.5 millimeter trace. Pin one is not a power input, which might be deceiving because it's labeled plus five volts, but if we check our schematic again, this was the run pin. So it's a simple, effectively zero current input pin. That's why I've just used a very thin trace to connect from my five volt pad into my enable pad. What is critical, however, is the feedback trace routing. I have my feedback network, which are these compensation capacitor plus feedback divider resistors. I want to keep my buck feedback trace, this one here, as short as possible. I use a separate thin trace coming from the output of my capacitor, routing away from the inductor 
into my feedback network and then straight into my feedback node. I'm also trying to keep any high-speed signals, for example, this USB differential pair, a fair distance away from this buck feedback node. This is a fairly critical trace, important for stability and noise. So remember, buck switch node, you only make it as wide as you need to carry the current, but not any wider. The output of the LC network, you can make pretty wide short loops, which we did with our layout previously, and make sure to pay attention to the buck feedback network. On the topic of power, let's look at the power input as well as decoupling capacitor routing. My power input comes from the VBUS and ground pins from this USB connector, and I've simply used fairly wide traces, hooked them up together, and then straight into my Pi filter network like so, again, using 0.5 millimeter traces. You might think that the ground connections aren't connected at the moment, but remember we have the top polygon pore, which is ground, which will then hook these up together, and I'm using thermal reliefs on these pads. The USB-C -C resistors, which are my communication channel resistors, I've just used thin trace to hook them up. These are logic level signals. In terms of decoupling, for example, for U300, which is our IMU, we have C300 and C301. And for our MCU, we have C201, as well as on the other side, C204. Because we did the layout fairly neatly last time, I'd like to use thick as the pad traces directly in and short connections. And same goes for the IMU side as well. We can also see that I've routed power, and for such a low speed as Dyn as this, this is absolutely fine, but I'm taking my power connection from the output capacitor of my buck network rather than the output inductor. You might notice how I've connected some of these ground pins, for example, this inertial measurement unit over here. It turns out that only pins four and six are actually power grounds, and pin seven is just a configuration pin again. We go to our schematic, we can look at pin 7 is our PS, which is essentially a mode select pin, and that does not need a thick trace, for example, as a ground pin. So I've just hooked that up with this little connection here. In a more formal schematic, I would probably use net ties or maybe even a zero ohm resistor, just to make sure I have different nets, and so this isn't confusing for the person doing layout, because you might well assume that pin 7 is an actual power ground, for example, even though it's just a mode select. That's why you can see the different styles of routing rather than using a thick trace. I've used a thinner one here. This is also a visual indication that this is a mode select pin rather than a power pin. The signal connections going from the inertial measurement unit down to the microcontroller are fairly straightforward, again, because we've done a fairly decent job with layout. In certain cases, I've had to go pretty close with these traces, but as soon as I can, for example, if I'm routing chip select trace, control W to route, I could route along at the top here and then down at the last moment, but that means I've maximized the parallel segments running next to each other. Instead, I can just drag this trace and hook it up like so. So as soon as I have space, I break away and I give myself clearance between traces and traces, and this is to minimize crosstalk. This is particularly necessary for higher speed data signals for some clock, master in, slave out, master out, slave in, and so forth. So as soon as you can, try and break away and give yourself some more space. From our previous schematic, we had the chip select of the accelerometer and chip select of the gyroscope. And because we're using a fairly flexible microcontroller, we can switch these around. And I actually switched pins nine and eight around in the schematic. So the schematic from the previous video flipped these two pins around to PA2 and PA3. This is perfectly fine. We can just change that in software. The reason I did that is because it makes my routing so much easier. I did not have to use a via for this trace. If I press tab, I can select the whole trace. Other trace on the right side, I can just route in directly like that without using vias. In a four layer design, that might be less important, but in a two layer design, I want to minimize any jumps I have to the bottom layer. This is because if we look at the bottom layer, we ideally want this to be just a solid ground plane with no cuts. Unfortunately, for some traces, it's pretty much inevitable that I'll have to route down and then across. And I try to keep these connections on the bottom layer as short as possible and come up as quickly as I can on the top layer. An alternative would to use jumper wires or to use zero ohm resistors in a larger package size to jump over traces. But then again, that also adds parts, adds assembly costs and so on. So preferably, try to make a solid ground plane on the bottom layer with minimal cuts if you can. The microcontroller routing is fairly similar. Again, we've talked about the inertial measurement unit connections. On the right side, we have the oscillator, which we'll talk about in a second. At the bottom, we have our GPIO or I squared C header. Again, I'm just routing out as soon as I can. I try to break away between the clock and the data signal. They shouldn't be routed as differential pairs because they're not. They're two separate single-ended signals and will crosstalk if they are too close. Again, I'm using fairly thin standardized traces. 0.15 millimeters, 0.2 millimeters is perfectly fine. 
Also for veers, I'm using all of the same veers. I'm using 0.7 millimeters and 0.3 millimeters drill. And I'm just using one type of veer because in general, that will then also reduce your board fabrication costs rather than using very many different drill sizes. The oscillator, I've tried to keep as short as possible these traces rooting into the load capacitors and then into the crystal. This little dotted line you can see in red here is actually a polygon pore cutout. In Alton Designer, I can press P and then click on polygon pore cutout and that draws the same as a polygon pore, except it means that when I then pour a copper pore on top, this area will be emitted. In general, it's advisable not to have a ground plane or ground copper directly underneath the crystal. It's also not advisable typically to have traces or high speed traces running near any crystal oscillator. You can see one trace here, which is this end reset signal, again pressing tab to select the whole trace. This is completely fine. End reset is pretty much DC most of the time. Occasionally it'll be toggled to trigger a reset of the microcontroller. That's why this is fine to root like so, and also give this a longer length. I could of course use vias to root, for example, like so, place a via, come out the other side, but then again, that would cut up my ground plane. And reset is a very, very low speed signal. It's not critical at all. That's why I can just route it pretty much around the board like so. Lastly, we have the serial wire debug lines, serial wire debug IO and the clock. And those are simply short connections to the serial wire debug header. Then of course, we also have the USB differential pair. And for two layer boards, it can be quite difficult to achieve controlled impedance traces. Because the dielectric thickness is so wide, so the distance between the top layer and our reference, which is our ground plane on the bottom, is so wide, we typically need very, very thick traces to achieve, for example, a 50 ohm single-ended impedance or 90 ohm differential. Because this board is so small and we're only using USB full speed, so fairly slow rise and fall times, fairly low bandwidth, it's perfectly fine, although it might not meet the USB spec, to route this just as a simple differential pair, regardless of what impedance this is. This distance is very small, and although it is an impedance discontinuity, given the length scale involved, it isn't particularly significant. Unfortunately, also for USB-C connectors, we have four USB data pins, so two pairs of differential pairs, because we have two orientations for the USB-C plug. Again, in higher speed designs, I'm using USB high speed, and definitely if I'm using USB super speed, I would want a dedicated USB switch to switch depending on the orientation of my plug. For USB full speed and a very simple design like this, all I've done is then connected up the USB negative part of the differential pair like so, and the positive differential pair like so with these little stubs. These frequencies, this really isn't a problem. By going to Tools, Polygon Pores, Restore One Shell Polygon, I can bring back my top polygon or copper pore. Then we see the final result like so, we have our board pretty much rooted. So there isn't actually too much to it. Because we've done a pretty good job at laying out this board in the previous video, I've had a much easier time routing this board than I would have with a more difficult layout. I had to do minimal cuts and minimal jumps, and generally I didn't have to alter the layout or the pinout too much, for example with the microcontroller, and I could pretty much route just straight away. And that's why I like to spend quite a bit more time laying out, fine tuning, so I will have an easier job when it comes to routing later on. Then of course you need to add some final finishing touches. If you're using silkscreen for component designators like we are in this video, it pays also to move the silkscreen around a bit. So if I click on top overlay layer, I might want to move silkscreen so it isn't on top of via holes. Even though vias will be tented usually, which means they're covered with solder mask, having silkscreen on top of holes can look a bit off. So it might play around if you're really that worried about the aesthetics to move the silkscreen around a bit so it's not on top of holes. Additionally, don't forget silkscreen to give your pin one indications, polarity indications, so forth, and also to make it consistent. So I'm using only one direction horizontally and one orientation vertically for my silkscreen, for example. I of course want to add text, for example, maybe a little description or name of the board, revision number, what maybe the connectors do. And the way you can do that at Altium Designer is go to one of your overlay layers, so top or bottom, press P, then either click on string, which is over here, or press S. And this will let you place a string. So I click somewhere, right click to cancel the command. I can type in a text and I, for example, put my initials down. And if I want a different font, I can click on true type and select font, change the text height and so on. In general, I recommend not going as a text height smaller than one millimeter. So one millimeter is a minimum, and that's pretty much okay legibility wise. Also, you don't want to use too thick of a stroke width depending on text height. If I use, for example, 0.3, that might look a bit too big. So 0.15 and one millimeter text height for fairly small boards is fine in my eyes. I've also added my logo over here. The way you can do that is going to your silk screen, then the top menu bar, going to place, graphics, and this drawing the area you want and then selecting the file from the dialog box that opens.
I also like to place my initials, the date when I did the layout and routing, finished this board, and also a revision number of this board, revision A or 0 0.1, however you like to do your versioning. It also usually pays off, I haven't added in this design, to add the pinout of certain connectors. For example, this connector here is useful not to always have to open the documentation or the schematics, but rather on the bottom side or next to the connector add, this is power, this is ground, this is I2C, SDA, SCL, and so on. And that's something I'd strongly advise you to do. Once you're happy with your layout and routing, of course you need to do is design rules check. The first thing I like to check is if all my connections are routed, and the way I do that typically, in my case, I would go to the top, go in reports, board information, scroll down and just select routing information and then click report. You can see we have 90 connections in total, routing completion is 100%, and therefore we have zero connections remaining. And at that point then I would do a design rule check. I also wouldn't just do a design rule check at the end of my routing phase, I would do it in between as well, and of course you can enable an online DRC, which checks as you route and as you place. To do a design rule check, go to tools, design rule check, you can keep the default options as they are, and then simply click on run design rule check. The design rule check will open, and typically the most important design rules you should check for are of course clearances, any collisions, any short circuits, and so forth. Here we have a few messages, for example, minimum solder mask sliver, silk to silk clearances, and so on. Silk to silk clearances might be if I have my silk screen touching like so and we don't have enough clearance between them and these aren't really errors, they're more warnings. It might not look very nice, but it's not technically an error. Solder mask slivers are essentially the spacing between two solder mask openings. For example, this distance here, if I press Control M, I can use the measure tool and this is approximately 0.5 millimeters, the sliver between this and this is absolutely fine to manufacture. Where Altium Designer, quite rightly, is complaining is that we have these pads, and between these pads, this registers as a sliver. So it might be hard to see, but for example, this spacing here is very small, and that will register as a bad solder mask sliver, for example. Another area might be in this buck converter I see over here. Again, I'm on the top solder layer. I can measure this, and this is a very small solder mask sliver, for example. Typically, manufacturers were able to produce this. In the fab house, they'll usually create a solder mask opening across this whole area like so across this whole area and therefore get rid of these solder mask slivers which won't be able to produce. Keep in mind that there then won't be solder mask in these black areas like so, which might cause problems with soldering. Solder mask slivers, if you're aware of them and you're okay with not having solder mask between certain pins, and of course sometimes this is unavoidable, you'll have to adjust your design rules and then make sure this is okay. And of course, as always, talk to your manufacturer to know what is possible and what isn't. We're pretty much done with the layout and routing and the kind of the ba very basic finishing touches of this board. Of course, there's far much more you can do and this is simply to serve as an introduction and kind of pointers of what aspects you need to pay attention to when it comes to layout and routing. In the next video, we're then ready to produce our output files for this board and also some small assembly documentation. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was useful and gave you some insight into the PCB routing technique for various aspects such as the buck converter, MDU, IMU, and so on. Again, make sure to try this out for yourself at Alton Designer and rewatch this video as necessary. In the next video, we'll finally then be producing our output files such as Gerber, pick and place, bill of materials, and so forth, which we can then send to our preferred manufacturer. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.